The 2018 legislative session is done, and while lawmakers did rework the budget, they left some other issues on the table. We'll talk about it with Governor Pete Ricketts. And what needs to be done to make sure all Nebraskans who want access to broadband internet can get it? That's what we'll discuss today on Speaking of Nebraska. Welcome to Speaking of Nebraska. I'm Grant Gerlach. We're here to discuss some of the important issues facing our state, like access to technology. According to the most recent figures from the Federal Communications Commission, broadband internet is available to about 90% of Nebraskans. But that figure drops to 66% in rural areas. A little later in the show, I'll talk to State Senator Kurt Friesen and Gary Warren of Hamilton Telecommunications in Aurora about what it could take to connect the rest of the state. And we'll take a look back at the history of the Nebraska Hall of Fame. But first, a look back at the 2018 legislative session that ended Wednesday. NET News legislative reporter Fred Knapp caught up with Governor Pete Ricketts for a look back at some of the things that passed, like the budget, and some things that didn't, like property tax cuts. But they started their conversation discussing Ricketts' recent trip to Washington, D.C. to talk trade at the White House. All right, well, Governor Pete Ricketts, thanks very much for being with us. My pleasure. You just got back uh, from D.C., where you met to a meeting about uh, ag and, and trade issues. Uh, what, what was that like? Well, it was really a good meeting. The president called in a number of representatives from Midwestern states, and uh, Senator Grassley said that in his 37 years in the Senate or whatever, that uh, it's very rare for a president to call a meeting of agricultural leaders together to talk about the ag economy. And it was really a great opportunity to be able to share with uh, the president some of our concerns with regard to trade and the retaliation of tariffs. You said after the meeting that uh, he expressed a commitment to increasing trade, but uh, how do you square that with his threat of tariffs on 100 or $150 billion worth of Chinese goods and their threat of retaliation against soybeans and pork? Yeah, so what I think what we have to understand, this is part of an overall trade strategy that the president has you uh, have to be able to get people to the table to get them to negotiate, and that's what he's doing. He's a tough negotiator. He doesn't want to give away anything, and he wants to be able to, and he plays his cards pretty close to his vest to be able to get what he wants. But we are seeing progress in, in things like getting the chorus agreement, and also, uh, you know, again, if the president's optimistic for pushing forward, and that seemed to be kind of the tone with NAFTA, obviously the proof's still in the pudding. We still have to get these trade deals signed, but uh, I think it's part of an overall strategy that you can see progress being made. It sounds like uh, a game of chicken where you threaten things and then you, you pull back. But the trouble with chicken is that sometimes nobody pulls back and they just uh, collide. Are you all worried that these tariffs will, in effect, go into effect and hurt Nebraska farmers? Well, certainly that, that is a risk that, uh, that is out there. And that's one of the things that when we talked to the president, we asked him not to have happen that we uh, you know, wanted to make sure these trade deals got done, we got better trade access, which is certainly true with what we want. The president uh, mentioned something about maybe we could do some sort of aid to farmers if there was some short-term pain, and universally in the room there was pushback and said, no, that's not what farmers want. Farmers right, that's the $30 billion farmer, in right, yeah, subsidies. Farmers don't want, yeah, farmers don't want more subsidies. What farmers want is trade, not aid. And so that was a, a message that we were able to deliver to the president as well. So. Hopefully he's, he's taking all this stuff into consideration as he's thinking about his strategy and how he implements it. But, you know, whenever you've got any negotiation, and I've been in, involved in, in high-level negotiations, uh, there are always going to be tension uh, until you actually get to a deal. Well, now moving to things closer to home, um, how would you evaluate the uh, 2018 session of the Nebraska legislature? Well, we made some very positive accomplishments. The most primary being living within our budget. Uh, one of the things we've seen, because farm economy has been down, you know, farm income has been cut in half since 2013, is that we, our revenues at the state have fallen below our forecast, which means that we've got to tighten our belts and live within our budget, just like any Nebraska family has to do. And we were able to constrain spending in this session. You know, we cut the budget 2% next year, except for the university, which is going to be cut 1%. 
And so we have constrained that spending, and if our revenue is hit forecast, we'll be able to live within our means with regard to that. You took a lot of heat um, for you had originally proposed a 4% cut next year to the university and other institutions of higher education. The Appropriations Committee reduced that down to 1%. You had the opportunity to restore the 4% cut with your line item vetoes if you wanted to. Uh, what was your thinking in deciding not to do that? Well, remember that the budget, as with many of these policy issues, is a give and take between the executive branch and the legislative branch. So it's a back and forth. And we were also helped out by a slightly better forecast in February as well. So in the grand scheme of things, you know, it's a trade-off. You don't always get everything you want. And if we hit our forecast, we'll be able to live within our budget with the, the budget that the Appropriations Committee gave to me. And that's why I signed it. Uh, also in that budget, we got some key language to help protect our Title X dollars and make sure that they will not go to anybody who's performing abortions, directively counseling for abortions, or referring to abortions. Because that's when not those, those Title X dollars cannot be used for that. As you point out, federal law already prohibits those funds from going to abortion. Um, there are those who supported uh, or opposed your language who said, um, this is going to cut off one of the major grant recipients, that is to say Planned Parenthood, which serves about 8,000 uh, mostly low-income women with uh, preventative services and contraception, that sort of thing. Are you concerned that this will leave a vacuum now that this language uh, is in there? No, the same amount of dollars will be spent. Uh, the amount of dollars aren't changing. And certainly if organizations want to change their structure to be able to comply with the new law, they are welcome to do that and be able to apply for the dollars. So, uh, you know, what we have done is said we're making sure that there is going to be that solid wall between those dollars and anybody who's involved in the abortion industry. And that's what, by and large, taxpayers want. Taxpayers want to make sure there's a separation there. And as you know, we've had in the past where we had some audits that showed that organizations who were receiving those dollars had used them for abortions. And so this is a way to make sure that doesn't happen again in the future. I believe the figure was about $2,000. And of course, the defenders of Planned Parenthood said that was a coding error out of $270,000 that they're getting this year. On the assumption that they're not going to get out of the abortion business, um, I come back to the question of they provide these Title X services to about 8,000 of the 28,000 people who got them last year. Uh, are you confident that with the funding staying intact that other people will step in to provide those services? I think they're mostly in Lincoln and Omaha. Yeah, I, I actually, I absolutely believe, again, with the same amount of dollars out there, people will still be able to get access to the, those health care dollars. It may be different organizations, but it'll still be available. Moving on to the uh, what didn't get done, you, you mentioned the property tax thing. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we got to continue to work. It really is unacceptable that the legislature for two years in a row now, two years in a row now, has not passed property tax relief. And what we have to do is now work to be able to find what we will be able to do to provide that tax relief, and also really encourage uh, our senators who are so fixated on raising taxes that that's not the path that you can't raise taxes to lower taxes, that we have to constrain spending and look for paths that way to be able to get this. And we also have to remember, the situation didn't happen overnight. It's happened over a period of a dozen years. And we're not gonna get out of it overnight either. We have to make that commitment to making it, and that's what the bill that Senator Smith and I proposed, LB 947 did, it made that commitment to property tax relief over the long term. That's the way we need to be thinking about how we actually deliver it. One of your uh, frequent critics in the legislature, Senator Morfeld, said that uh, uh, if he had gone to his nonprofit board of directors and said, hey, uh, our, our revenues are down, uh, our, we need to cut expenses, but we also need to cut our revenues, he would have been fired. Uh, he, he said uh, that's, that was the approach you were taking. Well, that's absolutely disingenuous. I mean, that's not the way this works. I mean, what you have to do is make that commitment to, prop to tax relief by, you know, budgeting it for it. And that's what we did. We put it in the budget so that we would make that commitment. It involved less than a percent of growth in our revenues when our revenues on average grow four and a half or five percent over any 20, 30 year period. So it was absolutely manageable within the budget to be able to deliver that. And under his logic, you'd never do tax relief. But of course, that's what Senator Morfield wants. He never wants to see tax relief. He wants to see every dollar taken from Nebraskans that he can and spends it. That's not my philosophy. My philosophy is those dollars belong to Nebraskans, 
and that we should return them to ne Nebraskans. And by managing our budget, we can do that. So as you know, there's a petition drive out there that would uh, uh, reduce property taxes and leave it up to the legislature to figure out how to pay for it. There's also one for Medicaid expansion. There's one or two for legalization of marijuana. Um, are you and the legislature out of step with Nebraskans on those issues, or is the system not working somehow? Well, it remains to be seen what happens with those ballot petitions, but let's go back to where the legislature clearly was out of step, which was when they repealed the death penalty. And that ballot petition drive actually passed with people, the people of Nebraska restoring the um, death penalty 6139. So it was very clear that the legislature was out of step with, with regard to what had happened. You mentioned uh, the death penalty. Uh, uh, Attorney General uh, has applied for uh, an execution date for Carrie Dean Moore, who committed a couple of murders in 1979. That's almost 40 years ago. Would executing him now be justice or vengeance, or what would it be? It would be carrying out the law, and the law as not only written in our state here, but also as been issued by the judges and the people who are part of the justice system when that sentence was determined. So that is our responsibility, is to carry out the law, and that's what the law says. And uh, looking forward, uh, um, what do you see as the major challenges that you still want to tackle? Well, we still need to continue to work on property tax relief. Uh, our farmers and ranchers are paying two, three, four times the property tax per acre as their counterparts in South Dakota or Iowa or Kansas. So we have to address that. Again, it has to be something that's manageable within the budget, and it has to be done with a commitment, but it can't be done all at once. It's got to be done over time because this problem developed over time. So that's a big thing that we have to do. We also have to continue to make sure we manage our budget. And then finally, we just have to keep doing all the things we can do to be able to not only be competitive on taxes, but just to be easier to do business with in the state. So that's part of what I'm doing administratively with my agencies to help streamline our processes, make sure we're doing a better job serving our customers, and making sure that companies can invest and create jobs here because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, creating jobs so that our people can have those opportunities to enjoy the good life, to send their kids to school, to go on that family vacation. That's what, the, you know, all policy ultimately gets down to creating those opportunities for Nebraskans to enjoy the good life. All right. Well, Governor Pete Ricketts, again, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Fred. Now we turn to a conversation about access to broadband technology. A fast internet connection is almost a prerequisite for business, education, healthcare, not to mention Netflix. As I mentioned earlier in the show, high-speed broadband is available to about 90% of Nebraskans, according to the FCC, but only about 66% of residents in rural parts of the state. Our next guests are here to talk about how to close that gap. State Senator Kurt Friesen of Henderson is chair of the legislature's Transportation and Telecommunications Committee, which, is, which looks over broadband. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Grant. And Gary Warren is on the executive team of Hamilton Telecommunications, which provides broadband and other services in the Aurora area and is looking to expand fiber connections across your service area too? That's correct. Thanks. Uh, first, when we talk about broadband, let's talk about what exactly broadband means. Uh, is there a definition for broadband that the state looks at? Well, there, there has been different definitions, and that's, that's one of the problems is when you say 90-some percent of residents have access to broadband, um, that's probably like 10-1 or slower. And what we're trying to set the definition as is 25 by 3. So that would be a higher standard. Yes. Uh, is there a reason for uh, looking at it that way, 25 being 25 megabits per second download? Yes, um, yes. and so we're, we're trying to keep it compatible with what's available in the urban areas. That's what the uh, definition of what our universal service fund should, should do is to help maintain that cost relationship and what the urban areas have access to versus the rural. Uh, how would you define broadband as, as a company that provides broadband? Well, I think it's, it's, it's all of those speeds, 25.3 as a standard, which the, the FCC kind of recently established in some of the, their universal service funding. And, uh, and Nebraska is following suit with Senator Friesen's bill. And, and I think it's a good standard. And, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be people in the rural areas who are going to want 100 megabit and, you know, even a gig and a, here and there. Uh, but, but realistically, to, to get something like 25.3 out there will we'll serve, the, serve the basic needs, allow some video and things like that. I mean, how quickly has that standard changed or how quickly have older standards gone out of, out of, uh, out of date? It keeps changing. 
And, and uh, the, the challenging part for Senator Friesen and his work as well as us in the industry is, you know, we, we get to 25-3 and you're gonna, Senator Friesen's going to be talking to me about 110. You know, I mean, that's, that's what's going to happen. And it changes rapidly. Uh, I mentioned those numbers, the 90% statewide, 66% rural. The, the numbers that the FCC looks at, that's Nebraska's numbers are pretty close to the national numbers, but there is that gap there between the urban and rural areas. Senator, can you describe what that gap looks like? What, what are the areas that don't have access well, to those when we Well, when we talk um, access to and rural broadband, I'm talking about anything outside of a city or village limits. It's that last mile service area that no one can economically or feasibly get to without some sort of help. Um, I guess that's, that's what we're looking at, is trying to get it out into those, those rural areas. Um, and um, what does that gap look like, like in, in your service area? How, how far out does uh, the high speed go? Well, we, we started uh, deploying fiber in Hamilton's territories, uh, well, 30 years ago. But we started going out into the farm areas about four or five years ago. We, we, we've been doing it in incremental steps, trying to get within three miles of the farmer and then within two miles. And, and now we've, de we've made the decision to go all the way to the farm with fiber. But it's been a gradual thing. And, and two things have happened for us in our area. One is some of those costs have gone down. The cost of burying fiber has not gone down. But some of the electronics has gone down. That's helped us. And the other thing is the demand's gone up, so more customers are taking it if we get it out there. But it is a challenge, as, as Senator Friesen says, in a rural area, very difficult to, to bury a fiber five or six miles out in the country and, and absorb that cost within a rate range that is acceptable to customers. Can you describe the process that is required to, to take a, a fiber connection, for instance, all the way to the farm? What actually goes into that? Primarily, it's a matter of burying it, and we use a plow system, and uh, uh, and you plow the cable in, but uh, and 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 costs vary depending on the terrain and how easy it is to plow. But you know, uh, they probably range in the rural areas from 15 to 20, to maybe 25,000 a mile, and and you can see if you have, you know, a couple farms out there that you're serving, and you spend a hundred thousand dollars to get out there, and then you want to give the customer a bill that's. 50, 60, 80 dollars a month, it's a challenge to do. Uh, so cost must, is, is it just cost with their, the technology is all there and it's just the cost of putting it all in? The technology is there and, and, it's, and it is the cost. And, and what I think the, what we said to the Public Service Commission is they're supposed to look at, at any of the other means that we could get high speed broadband delivered. It doesn't necessarily have to be fiber to the home in some of those really rural areas. It might be wireless, or it could be some other system that, that we can get it there, but it has to be, uh, you know, and in the end it has to be affordable. And so we wanna look at all the technologies. We're not just looking at strictly fiber. It's whatever would deliver what we would consider 25 by three, which is broad, high speed broadband. I'd like to talk about wireless a little, a little more in a little bit, but more on the money. The, there's been a lot of discussion about rural broadband at the federal level and making more money available. There was about $600 million in the omnibus bill that recently passed. Um, the FCC is preparing to put a couple billion dollars into broadband expansion, and the state has its own fund. Um, is there enough money being prepared to to pass through this problem coming? Well, I, I, I don't know if it's it, what you'd call it enough. It depends on how fast you want to get it done. And, and so in the end, I mean, the timing of it is everything. And, and the, the funds that we have used, the Nebraska Universal Service Fund, that number has been declining over the years as people drop their landlines, so the revenue has been declining. Well, so, maybe you should describe what, what that fund is and uh, what does the Nebraska Uni Universal Service Fund do and, and where does that money come from? So the Nebraska Universal Service Fund is based on in-state calls and it's a 6.95% of that revenue. And so that is used to help hook up hospitals and libraries and uh, things like that. And it helps, uh, helps locate cell phone towers. They've put up quite a number of cell phone towers. Um, they have helped lower the f cost of phone lines. And originally it was intended to just put in landlines into the rural areas and help with that cost and maintenance. So it does quite a few different things. 
Uh, but you said the amount of money in that fund has been going down. Uh, so is it really is it a good option for paying for expanding broadband? Well, yeah, it's still it's still what we're going to use. But we're, what we're looking at now is uh, the Public Service Commission has got a they call it a docket open on whether or not to go to a connection based system of collecting revenue since the revenue has been falling. So they'd like to stabilize that fund at uh, at a number. I've I've used a forty million dollar number. Um, I don't know where they're going to end up, but that was the kind of the gist of it now is that they would try to open the docket, do a, have hearings on it, and see if they can switch to a, a connection base instead of the revenue-based portion. Gary, are, are subsidies, whether it's grants or from the Nebraska Service Fund or from a federal source, are those, uh, that money from the public sector, is that absolutely necessary to finish expanding broadband? It, it's critical to the rural areas. When you get, you know, we have fiber to virtually every community in the state, and uh, and if and for, for the most part, that means every every resident within a community in a state can probably get some level of broadband or has reasonably close access. But you get out in the rural areas, it it definitely takes a subsidy of some kind, and and I think it's important. And and you touched on it too. The the we have a system for universal service right now that was based on the voice model. It's collecting revenues based on voice revenues. And, but what we want today, and we all want it, is a universal service broadband. And yet we don't assess those revenues. And, and I'm not suggesting we do. In fact, there's some legal impediments from doing so at the federal level. But that's a challenge. That's partly why this fund's going down in terms of um, available revenues, yet the need is, is greater than ever to get broadband out there. So that's a real challenge, but it, it, it definitely takes that subsidy to get it done. Well, thanks for being with us, Senator Kurt Friesen of Henderson and uh, Gary Warren of Hamilton Telecommunications. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Here's some stories NET News is working on. Fred Knapp will have a story wrapping up the just completed session of the legislature where senators accomplished some things like raising speed limits but failed on many people's top priority of lowering property taxes. After nearly 80 years of heavy federal restrictions, hemp could soon make a comeback as a cash crop. Colorado is the country's top producer after hemp was legalized there in 2013. Harvest Public Media looks at the latest proposal in Congress to legalize it nationally. And nine major party candidates are running for U.S. Senate in Nebraska. Mike Tobias begins his series of candidate profiles with stories on Republican Jack Heidel and Democrat Chris Janicek. For more of Mike's Senate profile stories, listen over the next couple of weeks. And listen for all of our signature stories on NET Radio or at netnebraska.org slash news. Also connect with NET News and our journalists on Facebook and Twitter. Buffalo Bill, Cody, and Bess Streeter Aldrich are two notable members of the Nebraska Hall of Fame housed in the state capitol. In this week's Nebraska History Moment, more on this tribute to outstanding Nebraskans. The Nebraska Hall of Fame was established in 1961 with the induction of George Norris as a way to officially recognize prominent Nebraskans. The process of determining who can be inducted has changed through the years, but since 1998 the rules state that no more than one person can be added every five years. Candidates will not be inducted until at least 35 years after their deaths. Busts of the inductees are displayed at the state capitol Currently, there are 25 members, with another to be selected this year. Nebraska Medal of Honor recipients are also members of the Hall of Fame. 73 Nebraskans have been awarded that nation's highest military honor. A plaque honoring them is on display on the 14th floor of the Capitol Building. That's all for this edition of Speaking of Nebraska, and in fact, this wraps up our current run of episodes. We hope you've enjoyed the discussions here over the last several weeks, covering everything from the business of college sports to a program helping Nebraska inmates become business people. We've talked about the future of the death penalty and how the future of trade policy could impact farmers and ranchers. Go to our website to watch and share past episodes. And we'd like to hear your feedback. Send an email to news at netnebraska.org. Thanks for being with us for Speaking of Nebraska. Good night.